the first season of One Punch Man was one of my first experiences within the sphere of anime series that became and remains one of my absolute favorites, being one of the very few shows that made me read the two sources of material, being the manga and the webcomic, sporting comedy, parody, stellar animation and so much more. At the time of watching it I was hard pressed to find any faults with the show and I still sort of am, since the only complaint I have is that it was quote unquote too good of a show for me at the time. And what I mean by that is that One Punch Man exhibited so many things that fell into my categories of preferred elements in a show and combined them in such a way that it became my absolute favorite show at the time. And after having rewatched the first and second season for the fourth time, I realized that the only way to proclaim my adoration for the show, which inadvertently created my single minor complaint, which isn't about the show in of itself, is to tell you how One Punch Man spoiled me in all of its splendor, and how it at the time raised the bar for me as an enjoyer of the medium and made it so that most other shows within the various genres One Punch Man incorporates seemed subpar to me in many aspects. And while I'll be delving into various elements that may seem like an analytical review of the show as a creative work of fiction, this is essentially an attempt at singling out the specific parts and details that spoiled me in terms of my personal enjoyment of One Punch Man. So while I don't think a critique can be objective unless you're going by an established set of rules to base your critique off of, I would be remiss if I did not add that this is just my subjective view and experience of the show. I'll be using the first season as a reference point as that was my only venture into One Punch Man at the time, but I will be using information from the manga and webcomic when I see fit for certain purposes that has not been revealed in the anime, as a lot of things I'd like to include in this review as it were, is yet to be elaborated on in the anime, and certain parts would be much more concise in an unfulfilling way should I solely stick to the information given in season 1. And lastly, to avoid adding the phrase, quote unquote, in my opinion every other sentence, keep in mind that these are just my opinions based on arbitrary thoughts I chose to include in this video, both recent ones and from back when I first watched season 1 of One Punch Man, as well as I can remember them. The first thing I'd like to talk about that adds to One Punch Man's repertoire of elements is the characters. And while a lot of the many characters that make up the One Punch Man cast are well done in their own right, there are a few I'd like to dedicate an extra amount of focus on. The first character I'd like to talk about is none other than Saitama himself, being the character that we first follow and the one that we see the world reflected off of his smooth scalp. While also being the official main character it felt the most prudent to start with the caped baldy. We first meet him shortly after witnessing the destruction created by the dragon level threat vaccine man that we later learn is a rather huge deal and the world's news outlet reporting on the ensuing disaster, with our protagonist looking on through a screen before deciding and stating that he'll take this agent of destruction on. We also get a glimpse of the protection and prevention of threats such as these in the form of the Hero Association, but more on the aforementioned terms and organizations later. As vaccine man is about to eliminate a lone survivor of his previous bombardment, Saitama intercepts and saves the survivor in the blink of an eye, probably way faster but more importantly, we are finally properly introduced to Saitama himself. Kneeled over, his cape flowing to the side, as he's putting the survivor whom he saved from certain doom down, vaccine man inquire regarding this unknown hero's identity, whom looks back at his powerful adversary while cracking a smile, before the iconic moment of Saitama telling us, the audience, and vaccine man that he's just a guy who's a hero for fun. The art style of Saitama's face now much more simplified than what was visually implied moments before. This introduction enrages Vaccine Man as he shares his origin and purpose of being before he transforms into a much more monstrous form seemingly about to attack a protagonist, but is, as we all know, ended in a single, unfaced punch. Saitama focuses his attention on his gloved fist, not triumphantly, but furiously as he's now the enraged one, before he lets out the pain sentence. And right there, right in those moments, One Punch Man had its hooks deeply lodged in my attention center and had me watch the entirety of the first season in one sitting. To be completely honest, the moment Saitama introduced himself is more endearing to me than when he obliterates Vaccine Man, because it perfectly sets his part of the story in place. He is exactly what he says he is, just a guy who's a hero for fun. Nothing more or less was needed to encapsulate what the deal of this creative work of fiction would mostly be about, and Saitama's role in it. The aforementioned moment after, where he one punches Vaccine Man, is a close second and to me a tad bit subliminal in a sense as it both confirms the title of the show while also symbolically annihilating the same tropes the show itself will utilize and parody in its own way throughout its duration. 
In other words, the simple yet very effective premise is concisely presented in a few moments and didn't leave much up in the air, but set the stage to be built upon in grandeur. Shortly after our brief yet memorable introduction to Saitama, one part of the world he lives in and one type of monster it spawns, we are taken back three years to Saitama's relatively recent and less than humble beginnings as the unknown hero. And talking a bit more about Saitama himself now, as we all know what happens during his backstory, he is a character that a lot of people can relate to in certain ways. I don't have any relevant statistics, but I feel it's safe to assume that most of us don't exactly dream of becoming salesmen. I'm not disparaging any vocational choices or the personal necessity thereof, but while Saitama is partly a parody of the typical shonen protagonist, he is also a good representation of different things. And the most obvious one to me is the exhausted, to the point of apathy, conquest of finding and getting a job you don't really want because you have to for any of many possible reasons. And finding something that ignites the passion in one's soul by disemboweling a humanoid crustacean is something that is both relatable and inspiring at the same time. And it's presented in such a easily absorbed and enjoyable way that doesn't feel forced, but it also includes the possible downside of finding something really engaging, the diminishing returns and eventual search for the initial excitement. Saitama is essentially a representation of what a lot of us viewers would have become had we acquired the same level of physical power as Saitama has. The flip side is potentially becoming a tyrant over the planet, but assuming you'd want to be a quote-unquote hero, Saitama's disposition is very likely. But that's assuming you're also only looking for something stimulating or fun. If Saitama looked at it differently, he could see his power as a chance to be the all might of that world. But of course that wouldn't make One Punch Man what it is, and Saitama himself states that he's only doing it for fun. But like with people in real life, there are nuances, because while Saitama states that he's a hero for fun, he also mentions the loss of progress and that he can't grow anymore, that he wishes for the thrill of a real fight, and that he feels empty on the inside because of that. So it begs the question if he's actually in tune with his emotions and aspirations or lack thereof, or if he never wanted to be a hero in the first place, and simply wanted something to grow and get good at. And in fighting Crablante that ignited his passion, he simply started focusing entirely on that, and now that he's in many ways the best at it, it's no longer interesting. Just like in many real life cases, if you find a new interest and do nothing else but pursue that interest, chances are it will lose its charm. So another message that comes with our caped baldy could be to widen your horizons and not rely on a single hobby or activity. Unless of course you never grow tired of it, or if you do and still stick to it, then that's your prerogative. But I feel that Saitama represents a lot of those types of things. While the premise is that he is a parody of the typical shonen protagonist, I feel as though he's also, as I mentioned before, much more a realistic representation of a real human in our modern world. So he's a character that's not so much deep as he is realistic and relatable, as far as that goes in this work of fiction anyways. And also simply a character you can put in any situation either to parody something or to create a genuinely awesome scenario with. The second character I'd like to share my views on is the secondary main character, the demon cyborg Genos. Like many people have already stated, Genos is the more typical archetype for when you think of a shonen main character. He is briefly introduced during the post credit scene of episode 1, wandering away from the scene of exsanguinated livestock, making his way toward the city of his true introduction. And in episode 2, aptly titled The Lone Cyborg, he is properly given his time to shine. Going back to what I mentioned before about being the typical archetype of a battle shown on main character and why he's a very appreciated addition to the story. Genos's home village was ravaged by an out of control cyborg that somehow failed to eliminate a younger human Genos, the latter of which swore to seek the responsible cyborg out to claim vengeance for himself, his family and his village. And as fate would have it, the scientist of justice, Dr. Kusuno, was on his own quest of pursuing the mad cyborg and accepted Genos's request of being turned into a cyborg himself to be able to stand up against the calamity that had caused him the grief of losing all that was dear to him at the time. And as such, the lone cyborg was created and initiated his arduous journey towards retribution. So already we have the title of an episode that could very well be the title for its own story. A backstory that gives the character something to work towards, with the twist being that he became what he seeks to destroy in order to destroy it. And the way Genos talks and acts in general just affirms his role in the story, to be the parody of the strong yet not strong enough main character that just has to get stronger for a certain purpose, and to complement Saitama's more apathetic demeanor and does so very effectively. Because if the story was entirely revolved 
revolving around Saitama, the show would become tired very quickly since his part and purpose of the show is different from Genesis. So as a contrast to Saitama, who is the aforementioned character at the end of a show in terms of power and his boredom due to it, we have a character who is more or less in the beginning of his own show in a sense. And how these two different crafts of characteristics and personalities interact is what makes a lot of One Punch Man more engaging than it would have been without it. Genos is funnily enough also, and probably deliberately so, the class of fighter that can't get physically stronger, more powerful or better in terms of pure physical stats without literally being upgraded. Dr. Kusano being the one responsible for that in this case. Which to me seems like the perfect parody of a main character that has very rapid developments in terms of fighting ability, but not in a way that makes it entirely obvious or forced, but at the same time displays these exact things quite clearly on several occasions. Genos can of course become more strategic and work on bad habits as his brain and spine are the few parts of him that are still human, and by decree of the narrative he mostly finds himself in situations where those modifications, both physical and mental, only help him so much, because there's always a bigger mountain to climb after every progress implemented into his robotic arsenal, which also plays into the theme of always having to get stronger for his final showdown with the mad cyborg. And in that same vein, Genos also, like I touched on before, serves as the character we can hope to see improve in various ways and celebrate for when he accomplishes things previously out of his reach. In terms of his personality, there isn't all that much to add or talk about since he, among a lot of characters in the show, is very cemented in his assigned role. He laments his shortcomings, motivates himself towards his improvements such as they are, cogitates about his past, treats those he considers his friends with respect and incinerates, or at least tries to, those whom he considers his enemy, such as the lone demon cyborg, Genos. We are first introduced to the slender ninja with a redundant name in the building of a wealthy individual known as Seneru, the latter being targeted by a group going by the name of the Paradisers, but to Seneru's relief, the aforementioned ninja informs his current employer that he's still under contract and will swiftly implement a removal process of the Paradisers, a process which is indeed swiftly implemented and quite successfully so, before our ninja crosses paths with the main main character of the narrative that is One Punch Man. In a similar vein to Genos, Sonic is a character that could very well be the main character of his own show, but in a different genre. While he doesn't seem to have a specific goal in mind, the way he's portrayed makes it clear that he's not your average run-of-the-mill side character. On paper he pretty much is a side character in terms of screen time, but in his own right he's slightly more intricate than what is let on, in season 1 of the anime at least. What we are let in on is that Sonic was born in a ninja village and have been perfecting his technique since childhood and that he's been working as a bodyguard and assassin and seemingly all in between. But other than that he's at a glance a very fast ninja with great pride in his abilities. In the web comic and manga however, it is revealed that a certain character is from the same ninja village as Sonic and that both of them purposely underperformed to be subjected to more difficult training in order to maximize what their training could provide. Alongside that there are other strings that somewhat tie together with other big names of the story. And like I mentioned before, Sonic doesn't get a lot of screen time in comparison to other characters. But after declaring his rivalry, we loosely follow Sonic at certain points and his newfound goal of defeating Saitama. And with the origin and demeanor that Sonic Sonic carries with him, the air of a more edgy main character is palpable. And long before I read the webcomic, I felt as though he had a much deeper background than what was initially shown, effectively making him yet another main character in One Punch Man, albeit with less screen time than I would have liked. And I'm not sure what type of characters he disposed of as an assassin, or whomever else besides Senator he worked for as a bodyguard, but the way he acts sets him apart from the typical murder hobo, to use a term. And that prevents me from seeing him as a typical antagonist as opposed to an edgy main character, and not to deviate into a different portion of the video too early, but despite his lesser presence on screen, Sonic is much more of an interesting character in many ways than let's say Genos, even though I think both of them are plays on typical main character tropes, like many other elements in One Punch Man. And of course there is the distinct possibility that all of that which was made his backstory was made in hindsight, but that would have surprised me and I'm certain his characteristics reminiscent of a different type of main character was intentional. And to save a couple of things about Sonic for a different topic, I'll leave it at that for now, as his lack of presence and such makes his interactions with other characters what makes a lot of what I like about him apparent. 
Moomin Rider is one of the most popular characters of the show. Despite his obvious lack of development in terms of power and personality, he remains dear to the viewers, myself included. And what he lacks in power, compared to the threats that were shown, he makes up for in his unbridled kindness and desire to save and help people. Similar to other characters in this video, Moomin Rider is a character on a journey, but with a more selfless purpose, to put himself on the line and no matter how bleak things may seem, he will always be there to do what he can. And he also seems to serve as the character that never gives up in the most motivated but grounded way possible, with a twist of not actually breaking through any of his limiters, and whether it's due to the mechanics of that being his mindset limiting him, or if he simply breaks through durability and pain tolerance limiters, it doesn't seem to translate into him getting any power-ups as they were. He doesn't seem to be trying to become stronger either by any of the many means available to him in the world of One Punch Man. Seemingly resigned to what he can do and his speech while taking the deep seeking on really helps solidify that notion. To once again reference another show, he's similar to Deku from My Hero Academy in certain ways. He has a rock solid concept of what being a quote unquote hero means, which may be pretty self destructive since it's pretty self sacrificial, but alas, no matter what setbacks he may experience, he doesn't let that get in the way of his perceived purpose or let it create resentment or bitterness. But unlike Deku that meets All Might and gets past the metaphorical torch, Moomerider remains at the same level throughout most of the entire narrative, let alone season 1. His mission in life is simply to help as many people as he can can, being the shining example of a protector of the people, while also serving as the occasional comedic punching bag, the character that should have the power that other characters possess, and possibly the parody of the characters whom willpower unlock the aforementioned power-ups. Not a character in of itself, I know, but it contains most of the characters that supplement the main cast. The Hero Association in of itself was appreciated at the time for the simplicity of having an organization where people could apply to become official heroes. And in hindsight, it works really well as a way to give an overpowered character like Saitama some semblance of an official journey in form of ranking up, but also later on when interacting with some of the heroes in the association. The sound design is an important aspect of any given show, whether it be anime or something else, and if done poorly, could easily be something that detracts from the overall enjoyment of the show, even if the story and or visuals range from decent to great. And at the time of watching season 1 of One Punch Man for the first time, I did not notice how beautifully crafted and implemented the overall sound was. Every sound effect fit every part where it was used, ranging from the simple leisurely sounds of opening letters, the drone that delivers those letters, to the more high octane sounds of air scythes ripping through buildings, sword slicing through alien skin tissue, or Saitama going through alien architecture. It's really apparent that there was a lot of effort put into making the sound effects fit as well as they did. A couple of parts where the sound design was especially enjoyable would be, when Sonic fights the Deep Sea King and the sound of Sonic dodging Deep Sea King's flurry of punches, how Deep Sea King's moray eel snarls, them jumping from rooftop to rooftop, and how the music goes from triumphantly hyper as it seems like Sonic might have the upper hand, before steadily reaching the latter part where there is no music at all tells a story on its own. The whole brief Genos vs Kabuto, where at first the former launched a blast of fire before rushing the latter, delivering a kick straight at Kabuto's face and the sound of impact as metal meets bug skin harder than metal is immensely satisfying, and the following consecutive fire blasts that came before the ensuing machine gun blows, moments before being sent flying and having his huge blast of fire negated by pure air pressure, was all fitted with great sound design, plus how the music was synced to match the entire exchange was awesome. And the fight between Boros and Saitama and the sound of the latter going through the pillars, you can hear the sound of him going through the other side, and that's something I didn't notice the first time watching. The whole fight between Saitama and Boros is awesome, and I'm hesitant to go into more detail about it, as I'd essentially be repeating myself as to how much I like each sound effect and the main theme in the background before transitioning into the more pensive soundtrack, as Boros talks about his home plan similarly to how the music transitioned in the fight between Genos and Kabuto. Suffice it to say that the fight is very well done, as most other fights in One Punch Man. I could go on about several other scenes and moments where the attention to detail was awesome, but it would end with me describing the first season start to finish essentially. So my recommendation to you watching would be to go and re-watch your favorite scenes and really listen to the sounds, because it is simply so well done. It's just so much better than I could ever describe with words. It's simply a case of a picture says more than a thousand words, but in this case with sound effects. The soundtrack for the show also fits the scenes it's used in, and accents the events unfolding in grand fashion. The action scenes, the whimsical scenes, the melancholic scenes and the emotional scenes to mention a few, all have fitting music that doesn't feel misplaced in the slightest. I think a lot of people, me included, would recognize it because of how iconic 
iconic it is. Even if someone were to play one of the sound effects, I'd probably recognize at least a few of them. By this point, I've heard some of the sound effects used in One Punch Man Season 1 and 2 in other shows, but still. There are soundtracks and sound effects that are just there, and then there are the ones in the first season of One Punch Man that really sticks out because of how well they are used and, of course, the scenes in which they are present. Season 2 has a similar effect, but for other reasons. What's more is how certain parts of certain soundtracks were used to a lesser extent in certain scenes to then be played in its full glory in other scenes. One example where I noticed this would be Boris's and his Dark Matter Thieves theme, and how it was partly used during the Deep Sea King arc, when the Hero Association are looking for heroes to help with the crisis. They may not be the most realistic of sound effects, but they do fit the show and they do their job well. Not that I think that realistic sound effects to be a criteria, and especially not in a show like this. But I just wanted to add that while I sing the sound design's praises, I don't think it's revolutionary in terms of actual sounds, if that makes sense. So in hindsight, due to me not realizing and appreciating it at the time, One Punch Man's soundtrack and array of sound effects were really well used and on their own they were and still are really good. As most people whom have seen the first season of One Punch Man will tell you, it looks great to say the least. The characters look like they have actual weight behind them, like they're actually made up of matter and mechanical constructs look realistically assembled and broken apart when the latter occurs. The movements of characters looks fluid, the designs and proportions are consistent, the lighting and reflection of of surfaces looks natural and not to mention the parts where the animation should be good it's amazing. The Sakuga moments, the impact frames and the special effects all blend together into a visual feast. To be honest, while most Recently rewatching the first season, I would sometimes forget the narrative and almost see it as a presentation of exemplary art and animation. The person who is responsible for making the webcomic and manga into an anime must have really loved the creation. The studio officially responsible is Madhouse, but it was actually non-Madhouse animators who stepped in and made it into what it is. It's like unless you keep your eyes open during the more action-packed scenes, you might miss a small but awesome detail, sometimes present during a single keyframe. Suffice it to say, it ranges from good to amazing visually, and I can't do it justice, nor do I feel a need to as its art and animation is what a lot, if not most people, already praise about the show. So it's almost like beating a very well-drawn horse really fluidly with a really well-animated bat. So this part that will be the main portion of the video will basically be me going through what I personally enjoyed about the experience in of itself with all prior subjects in mind. And to avoid just saying I enjoyed certain things for the spectacle of it, since that was mostly what I felt at the time, I will supplement this part with hindsight opinions, information, comparisons and whatnot. And unlike the subjects prior where I had some sort of parameter to work within, this will be much more scattered in comparison. To say the least One Punch Man Season 1 is a beast of an experience, with the source material and premise being a parody on popular tropes, while also making the best of the same tropes, coupled with awesome art, animation and audio design, making it something that truly did spoil me and had me write this presentation many years later. We follow a man whom we are introduced as the antithesis of your typical superpowered hero, introducing himself as a guy who's a hero for fun, and is then showcased to be the most powerful character in the series, while also being incredibly bored and at times flippant about it, and the latter most likely being due to comedic effect as I find it hard for someone as bored as Saitama is with his power to be as silly as he can be at times for none other than the audience. Or he decides to put on a comedic facade sometimes in front of enemies he's about to singular punch out of existence and in front of people that become his friends or so-called rivals. But to continue the point I wanted to pursue, it begs a lot of questions and speculation regarding the why to his disdain of his own power, but also what his actual goal and motivation for becoming a quote-unquote hero was to begin with. And with an aspiration so simple as having once dreamt of becoming a hero that could send monsters like Crablante flying with one punch, one would think that he'd be happy that he now can do that and much more. But he's not, and it's a very simple message of enjoying the journey and not the destination, and being able to grow doing something you actually enjoy. But in Saitama's case it's much more difficult to keep enjoying it since the point of what he found fun improving at was and is a monster extermination or technically the fighting within the extermination of said monsters. So when he can't feel fear or excitement during a fight because he knows he won't get hurt and that he will definitely win should he try in the slightest, it pretty much takes all the fun out of it. So he never actually wanted to become what he sought to become, he simply wanted to do something other than trying to become a salesperson. And what happened to happen simply happened. And the point of his character is to be a main character at the end of his show. So obviously all that I just said is just my personal take on it. But it could simply be traits of a character that's supposed to showcase just that. A character at the end of their show trying to find ways to feel the rush of the journey they set out on in the beginning. And as a show in of itself, it makes for many entertaining situations and interpretations. Saitama is in many ways activating God Mode in Skyrim or something. And just being unfazed by any and all beings that would have been threats without God Mode activated. 
and the boredom I personally feel doing that in Skyrim is also very similar to what is presented in Saitama, but being a character at the end of his show, he has a distinct lack of purpose within the narrative as it were, had it not been a parody and whatnot. And in a philosophical way, I guess you could call it, isn't supposed to be part of the show, or at least be very off to the side and offer insights and consultation to the less physically blessed characters, I guess you could call them. And all that alone makes for a, in many ways, relatable main character, while also being presented in such a silly, simple, yet effective way, that makes for many narrative scenarios that could be comedic, symbolic, and just plain awesome. Just the fact that his backstory is presented so early and by itself is such a mundane story if you think about it. A jaded unemployed man looks for a job he does not want who then saves a kid from a monster and over the course of three years that were only subjected to him in a few brief flashbacks, he becomes the most powerful being as far as we know and probably will ever know. But it makes the subsequent events much more digestible and the whole parody on the genre so much more effective. But nonetheless that on its own wouldn't be very interesting for very long. And so we have the other main characters like Genos and to a lesser extent Sonic. Genos is quite clearly the previously mentioned tried and true archetype for a shonen main character. His backstory and motivation is something I've by this point seen many times with varying variations and such. And he's such a perfect addition to the cast as a contrast to Saitama in terms of overall power, personality and design. And Sonic has basically the same general role as Genos, except that he's the character gone down the anti-heroic or at the very least antagonistic path and attempts to act as a foil for Saitama, only to be folded each time, which makes for pretty comedic moments. So similarly to Genos, whom we also follow through the story of One Punch Man, Sonic is on a mission of his own, but with different motivations and different ways of succeeding at said missions, and has had and still does possess an insatiable desire to get stronger. But unlike Genos and his backstory that we are given in great detail at the very beginning, we are not informed of Sonic's until much later, not the details then now. And not to mention their ways of fighting, the reversed order of backstory and motivation is yet another contrast between the two. So while getting the parody of the typical archetype of the hero with power above all others, we also get two additional main characters that are strong enough in their own right to be able to participate in the battles of ever increasing danger that the show throws their way, but while still having room to grow that garners improvements that they can display at different parts of the story. And while on the subject of different types of characters, I think that One Punch Man triggers a deeply ingrained liking of crossovers in me, since the show itself is almost like an entire series made of crossovers, but with its own characters. The world of One Punch Man is almost like a server in an MMORPG, where all kinds of characters appear in the set area as it were. There are ninjas, prophecies, monsters, typical main character archetypes, scientists, and the list goes on. It was almost too much to register at the time, it implemented tropes from various genres and parallel them while also bringing out the best out of each and every one of them. And it basically takes all of these different types of characters and elements and puts them in your very typical big city setting to go crazy in, with other locations in the surrounding areas, such as the House of Evolution as one example. I mean just the fact that the various cities are seemingly simply all just assigned letters as their names and that even the catastrophic event that was Boris's invasion was forgotten in a relatively short amount of time, makes it seem to me that the world and places the characters are in are just catalysts for the events that transpire. And one might argue that that's the case for most shows in that sense. And while I would agree in a lot of cases, I would have to argue that a lot of other shows give some sort of backstory or at least some semblance of an identity to the city or country they're in. In One Punch Man it's simply cities with the aforementioned letters with some having a farm, forest or mountain area outside or on the outskirts of it. Which isn't a bad thing in this case. The point I'm trying to make is that the where isn't really all that important to One Punch Man and at the time made it incredibly simple to follow along with and currently makes it seem to me that they are in fact simple and has to be huge places for the fights and whatnot to have a venue to display what they have to offer. And if a place has some significance to a character's backstory or to the story itself, it will be stated or made clear one way or another. In conclusion, it makes it easier to present all these different characters and events that takes place in these disposable environments because they are simply just that, disposable and it seems that no amount of damage done has a lasting impact on the world as a whole. Which may or may not be a joke, play on a trope or simply just the way that it is. Either way it makes the enjoyment much easier in my opinion when it's simply a city labeled with a letter and has a similar architecture to every other city we've been introduced to, as opposed to deciding to write a detailed description of each city and what each city's culture and such is like only to have it damaged and or possibly destroyed altogether. And like I said it could be a reference or joke to something in other shows where any and all damage done to the surrounding areas is quickly repaired or is simply forgotten about in a narrative sense. No matter the case I think it's a positive rather than a negative 
relative in One Punch Man's case. I may have mentioned it before, but what it does is seemingly a love letter to the same tropes it parodies, and while there is some depth to certain things that happens, it's at the same time purposely shallow, but not in a bad way. Don't get me wrong, I think One Punch Man is awesome and has a lot of things going for it, but people seem to enjoy making it out to be deeper than it is. When the show itself presents itself as a parody, and that the things said and done should, in my opinion, be viewed as such. But that's also the charm of the show, since the premise and execution of said premise is so simple and positively shallow, it allows for people to come to realizations, theories and conclusions on their own, while having the enjoyment of the show itself. I mean, the fact that Geno's documents and analyzes every mundane thing that Saitama does seems to be a representation of what many fans of the show likes to do, which is make something out to be much more than it is, which it may or may not be, but I am of the belief that it's mostly much simpler than what many likes to argue. Which, again, works in the show's favor rather than against it, for the reasons mentioned prior, and probably many more. It's also kind of like a sitcom if you think about it, but a crossover sitcom, where all these different types of characters are put in all the different scenarios shown. Thinking about it now, it reminds me somewhat of Scary Movie, except it is action slash shown on anime tropes and not horror tropes. Which makes it even clearer why One Punch Man felt right at home when I watched it, since both exhibit similar characteristics, except that Scary Movie is much more on the parody side than One Punch Man. I could totally imagine a baseline, similar to the one in Seinfeld for example, play after certain parts as Genos and Saitama spend time in the latter's apartment. My point is that the comedy was pretty much also right up my alley, disregarding that I didn't know all of the thematic references the show parodied. For example, I never watched any Dragon Ball, still haven't, so Boris's transformations were just awesome in of themselves to me. But by this point I know it's at least a nod to the transformations done in Dragon Ball. Whether or not everything was intentional or not, I feel like One Punch Man is very simple, but because of that makes it brilliant in a lot of ways. It gives room for things that might be frowned upon in other shows. Benefit of the doubt regarding certain things that spark debates among the viewers. is ambiguous enough to be interesting while also being clear about what it's all about. Being a parody of the very same things itself utilizes and brings out the best out of, but not too much so to become over tongue-in-cheek, but enough so that the parody is entertaining and the genuine action is exciting and combines and alternates between those elements. So at the time of watching season 1 of One Punch Man for the first time, the premise, ensuing story, quality of sound and visuals truly did spoil me a great deal. And to repeat myself, being a show that parodies tropes while also bringing out the best of them made it so that most other shows I watched that genuinely utilized and implemented similar tropes felt, for the lack of a better word, underwhelming. But that's pretty much it for this video, I hope you got some enjoyment out of this. I'm Anna Massey, and I'll see you soon. Have a good one.